Hi, I'm Allison Pease, Associate to the Provost for Faculty at John Jay College. This is Season 2 of our interviews with the college's past and current Distinguished Teaching Prize winners, in which we celebrate the thoughtful and inventive pedagogy of our Distinguished Teaching Prize winners. In today's episode, I interview lecturer in history, Andrea Ballas. She won the prize in 2011. I begin the interview by asking her what winning the prize meant to her then and what it means to her now. At the time, it meant and it, it meant a lot to me that the college was paying attention to teaching, that teaching was being regarded as uh, an actual craft, not just something that you did, you know, because you, you got to sign courses. And so there was like the idea of uh, a teaching practice, the idea of tying uh, the the research scholarly activities in in learning and teaching into what we were doing here. It was the first the first time that that happened. I think I won the award the second or third year that we gave it. What I did remember is that um, although there was a pretty elaborate application and you did, uh, it forced you or helped you, depending on how you want to look at it, to um, think about to articulate and um, make active, make conscious certain aspects of teaching, which is always a good thing. I mean, the idea of a conscious teaching practice, of a reflective teaching practice, is not something that we've emphasized here until very recently. And even now that we talk about it, we tend to talk about it in terms of best practices, effective things, we don't talk about how do you think about your teaching? How do you um, in, uh, think about what does it mean to have a teaching practice, to be a scholar of teaching and learning? Do you think faculty are tend to be unconscious about their teaching? Yes. I think that the conversations, a lot of the conversations that I hear are that I participate in happily and eagerly are, my God, my students haven't done their reading. What do you do to make them do their reading? Or do you have any suggestions? So uh, it's, it's tricks. It's tricks and treats. And we use them. We, a, a good teacher, an experienced teacher, has a big bag of them. And learning other people's are great. I love when I hear other people's. But? But it's not the same as a reflective practice. It's not the same of as setting a teaching goal for yourself at the beginning of the semester and checking in on it. It's not even the simplest things of, I make it a regular practice to sit down at the end of the semester and review what happened, to look at the what the teaching outcomes that I listed were, how effective I think uh, what the problems were, whether I uh, achieved the uh, the outcomes that are listed, whether I think the outcomes should be changed, um, what parts, what mistakes I made, what things I need to correct, what things I might want to read and find out before the next time I, I teach the course. All of those things ought to be part of, we ought to emphasize that that's part of what you teach. We put a lot of of attention into you have to write a syllabus. We put no attention into the idea that you have to evaluate it or evaluate your teaching practice because your evaluation is, did my students do well? If they did well, then I did well. Mm. But that's part of doing, I mean, part of it is is uh, helping students m- meet the outcomes, meet the goals, absolutely. But that's the student's job. Your job is how are you helping the students to do that? And that you have to think about separately because they may have gotten there that had nothing to do with you. Your students describe you as passionate. It's one of the things they love about you. Um, And I think we often prize passion, but what are you passionate about? I'm hearing you talk about this notion of reflective practice. 
What should passion be in the service of? Passion should be in the service of making it clear to students that we are here for one reason only, to help them learn. That what you expect out of students, what you want from students, is that they walk out of the room knowing things they didn't know when they walked into the room. I, um, I, I know that I get uh, impassioned about what I talk about. I know I get really excited. I know I get carried away. But I actually don't like the idea of a charismatic teacher. I, I think that what, that what happens is that that teacher then becomes uh, an entertainment. And students sit there having a, they may even have a fine time. But, for example, they're not taking notes. So what we're here to do is to help students become learners. This is the thing I'm passionate about. What we're here, the content is important, and it's much more important in certain programs than in others. I mean, programs that are working for certificates, programs where there's this mandated, state-mandated curriculum, all of those things, obviously, content is really important. But we also know that, that what's going to happen to our students when they go out in the world is that they're going to have to learn new things. That's going to be much of what they're going to be doing. So if so it is then important to help people become efficient learners. And you've been giving workshops on what you call getting started. Yes. And I believe you mean getting started on a research project? I mean getting started on thinking about something, really. Okay. Um, for those who have never been to your workshop, what, what can you tell them now about you know, getting started on thinking? How do we help our students get started on thinking. One thing is that we point out to them what they already know. I start my methods class for the last couple of years with a variety of, of uh, activities that I have worked out, but my favorite is buying a stove. And students come in and say, I don't know how to do research. I'm not good at research. I don't know what, I hate research. But if you ask a student to find the best pair of black shoes that season, hmm. they can find it. They can find the best price. They can give you evidence why these are the best shoes. They can, um, or evidence why, even though everyone says these are the best shoes, really, according to the ratings, they fall apart after you wear them in the rain, so you shouldn't buy them. That's research. That's all research is. And People think they can't do it, don't do it, don't know how to do it, and yet we do. Our, every one of our students does because they can all shop. <laughs> we don't have anybody here who can't shop mm -hmm. and not shop intelligently. So the stove exercise is you and your partner have uh, 45 minutes to find the most, the best stove between $900 and $1,200. I choose stoves because I figure students probably have not bought them. So they, nor thought about them. Because one of the first things that you have to think about is what makes a good stove? How do you decide whether something is a good stove? How do you frame the question? How do you begin? So, you know, where do you, where, how are you going to organize your search? Mm -hmm. So I ask students to simply write down every they sit there with their phones and Google, right? We're all happy. Write down every um, query. That's all. Just every time you ask a question, you Google something, you just write down what you Googled. And then afterwards, when we look at the stoves, and it's always interesting that sometimes that people choose different stoves or that some people actually found a better price on a stove except that it didn't include delivery, whereas the other people who found it, it did include... So it turns out people did a huge amount of research, come out of there knowing a ton about stoves. But then I ask students to look at what you did and turn it into a, a steps. The first kind of questions, the second kind of questions, the look at, at what your queries were and turn them into like a chart so that next time you're given a, a paper topic and you... you you don't know what to do, and it's the two days before the paper is doing. You at least have a place to start. You have your own list. You have a reminder of how you do it, 
and that you can. Professor Ballas class period look like? If there is such a thing. Well, of course there is. Um, I, I try, and I, I do what I assume many of us do. I try to minimize lecturing, um, although I frequently get caught into it, and I am really easily distracted. <laughs> so, and my students find that out pretty quickly so that they know that asking me a question about something that I've just mentioned in passing, I'll get excited. So I, I do understand that they're doing that to me. Um, we're always discussing reading. Uh, I believe in the idea of the flipped classroom. And, the, and meaning, what's your interpretation okay, of the meaning classroom? I think that, people think it's different things. Right, I think everybody thinks it's For me, it means that you... Encounter the material, think about the uh, material, and then in class together we use the material or do something with the material or, um, e or even if that's just discussing it and opening it up and looking at it in different ways. What I refuse to do, although of course like everyone else I get tempted into it and I wind up doing it, is explain the reading. I, I think that if we're spending our time essentially leading our students through readings, they have learned nothing. Nothing about how to find out information. They've learned a lot about how to write down, maybe, what you tell them, but they've learned nothing about learning. Right. It's like, uh, I do not upload, I use Blackboard a lot, and I, but I don't put readings on it if they come from uh, anything that's published that we have access to through our library. Because I know how to do that. I'm extremely good at finding things in the databases. I've been doing it for years. But, I, and I can do it for my students. Again, what have they learned? So you list a journal article I do. on your syllabus, and it's their job to research it and find it. Their job is to find it, print it, and bring it to class. Oh, and read it. Preferably. <laughs> I'd like to stick that in. But at least find it, print it, and bring it to class so that we can talk about it at the very least. So I'm interested in your notion of um, the problem of a charismatic professor. I agree with you. Um, and yet you have a background in the theater. I do. And so I wonder how you use your theatrical background to help student learning, right? So it, some of us might imagine that somebody with your background would would use that sort of entertainment side. You must use it in some other way. Yeah, the kind of theater that I did was um, non-traditional theater, but of course. And, uh, and, and this was the this late 70s and 80s, so uh, I worked with a system of improvisation that was developed actually by the people who um, who did Second City in Chicago, hmm. and it's these are called theater games, and the way they work is that you set the boundaries as the person making the game or directing the game. You set the boundaries of for the game. You make the rules, and then you step back, so that. Um, in theater, it's if you ask two people to sit on a park, to do an improv scene sitting on a park bench, they, nothing will happen unless they're experienced improvisers. But if you tell people to have a conversation sitting on a park bench, but one person always has to be standing and one person always has to be sitting, that somehow releases the, the flow of what you're doing. It allows connections to happen. It 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 gets you started. 
It gives you the external shape that you can fill in as you go along. So if you're good, you choose good rules. I mean, if you're experienced with this, you set the, the stove is a perfect example. I don't do anything. I set the rules. That's right. it. Right. So, great. Give me another example of like, one of your go-to student learning um, I wanted, I wanted to say techniques, but I feel like that might be too gimmicky for you. One of the things that you do as an activity for your class that you know, if I do this, the students can't fail to learn. Well, uh, clearly the most active, the better. Even if you're trying to go through a reading by breaking it up and having everybody, you know, do a paragraph. Um, because that enables you to talk not just about what was in each paragraph, but what context means. How, if we're doing a paragraph, what's the structure then? I mean, you tell me. Um, as much as possible, uh, I try to pick things where the students do the work, and this is back to what we were talking about a long time ago. The students do the work, and I sit there beaming at them from the teacher chair. I mean, that's <laughs> that's when it's really good. When you come into a room and there's a, when you're doing activities and there's that buzz of conversation and you walk around and people are not talking about football you know they are not talking about music they're talking about the topic mm -hmm. then that's a successful class then they're learning and you know i taught a class on death a few years oh maybe 10 years ago and the first day of class i asked everybody to write down what does it mean to be dead and everybody knew how? <laughs> well, they knew that it was when your heart stopped beating. They knew it was you know, when your blood stopped flowing. Some people who had um, religious feelings about this had different contexts for what death meant, uh, about it being corporal death but not spiritual death. But, er but almost everybody, sure, I know what death is. What a stupid question is that? Mm -hmm. I, I love it when it's a stupid question. Right? What a kind of moron are you? Because then you know you got a really good question. So that's what we did the first day of class. The last day of class, I asked the students to write down what does it mean to be dead. And mostly the students were, I have no idea. I mean, are we talking about brain death or are we talking about cardiac death? Are we talking about death in Japan or are we talking about death in the United States? Are we talking about death today or how death was regarded? I don't know. So to me, that's a, that's a perfect class. You walk out f way more confused than you walked in. I mean, <laughs> right? Because you have 50 new ways to think about it. This idea of backward design, which, I, I mean, I live and breathe by. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I have all the backward design books that there are. I mean, I, I think it's really important. I think that we forget. We get hung up in what we're teaching. We forget what students are supposed to be learning, right? I mean, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing, right, is that yeah. we think so much about are we successfully teaching yeah. that, and less about are they successfully learning. And that's, you know... That's the goal, because we already know it. In the spirit of making small adjustments to mm -hmm. our teaching that can positively affect student learning, what's one small thing you do in your teaching that you think others could adopt and that this would have a positive effect on their students' learning? I think that reviewing your syllabus, it, it, I mean... The best way to do it, and again, I always set up forms to do this and never quite manage, is to actually look back afterwards and go, this is what happened. This is what seemed to work. This is why it did or did not. I think that if you, that the more you do that and write it down, uh, the more you have a way to, to look at what happened as a whole and to make significant adjustments. I, I you know... I feel as I teach, I teach a, one of the uh, scientific world courses. Increasingly, I, I feel that students are intimidated by science and and back off of it. 
and that the purpose of this category of courses in part is to um, is to become an intelligent consumer of science. I mean, we all we all have to interact with the scientific world. So I've started doing vocabulary tests. I, I mean, if five years ago, if you had told me that I was going to have weekly vocabulary tests, I would have laughed in your face. But I have come to see that by not mastering certain basic vocabulary, the students are not understanding basic concepts, and they feel they don't have to. So that by going over those words over and over and over again, and when we do the reading or when we're having a conversation and they spend five minutes explaining something, then you turn to the rest of class and say, well, what one word could we have used? You know, oh, well, it's antigens, right? And then... That's the purpose of vocabulary. So I think that I've begun to think more about uh, vocabulary and what it means and how it empowers or doesn't empower us and how, you know, how the fact that bigly is not a word matters. And I I think that. Um, I have... So I think that that that's something that anybody can do. I think it would be best if you found a partner. I think, I mean, whenever possible, that's the the best thing that you can do is to find somebody that you can meet with regularly and talk about what you're doing. Not just, in, although it's fair, I can't get them to do the reading, which is fair, but also these things about, well, what is important to come out of? I mean, I've come to feel that I want my students from the, the history of science class, I want them to be able to, with confidence, read an article in the New York Times science section and just not feel that they, to know that they can do it, they can understand it, they have the vocabulary for it. I spend, this is the one thing that I, I have gotten to the point where my students will chorus this back to me, I admit. How do you know that? Where did that information come from? What statistics are you using? Did you just make that up? Because we all make stuff up all the time. And we know it. But we believe other people's made-up stuff if it's convenient. So where did the information come from? Mm. If you're going to tell me something like, how do you know it? And if you're going to think about, if someone's going to tell you something, how do they know it? So, like there's an ad for a dating service. Or there used to be, a, this is a while ago, a TV ad for I don't remember which one, but it, the ad basically said, you know, 67% more people found their partners through this dating app than any other dating app. Well, how can you know that? I mean, how can you possibly know that? Did they ask everybody who found a partner how many of them found them through Match.com? Did they ask everybody who subscribed to Match.com? Did they find, How do they know that? They cannot know that. They're just telling you. So, so, see, that's what we want to teach. That's that's what stands between the world and fake facts. I mean, that's the thing we have to teach, or that I have to teach. Some people have, I mean, I know my content, of course, but I don't think that's the most important thing I bring to my students, although frequently they do, and they use me as a, a reference. But what I think is that if I, that before I open my mouth and go, how do you know it, the class by the end of the semester will chorus back, how do you know that? So if they walk out of the class automatically thinking that, or even occasionally thinking that, well, my work is, you know, then my work was useful. Andrew Ballas, winner of the Distinguished Teaching Prize, thank you for your time. <laughs>